to uh, Talks at Google. I'm Matt Britton, and I'm delighted uh, to be hosting uh, this session uh, with one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in AI, working at the center of technology and politics for over a decade, from Downing Street to Davos, to the G7, to Google, and to DeepMind. Uh, I first, first met her when she was the policy advisor to the uh, person who became the Deputy Prime Minister of the UK. She then joined us at Google UK uh, on policy issues and then moved across to DeepMind in its early years as the first head of policy uh, for DeepMind. And she is now the director of the AI and geopolitics project at Cambridge University, no less, and has just founded the technology consultancy. And her book, which is AI Needs You, will be published by Princeton University Press uh, next week. So please give a very warm welcome to Verity Harding. Verity, Hi, welcome. Matt. Thank you. Or I should say welcome back. Yes, it's so nice to be here. It's so nice to be back. I miss the food. <laughs> I, I could smell it when I came in. <laughs> I was supposed to say, I miss the people. I, they know that I miss the people oh, yeah. already. I hope they know that anyway. <laughs> so, Verity, I mentioned a little bit of your pretty impressive biography. So yeah, thank you. for people who don't know Verity, maybe just tell us a bit about like, how did you get what drew you into politics and then what's drawn you through all those different interesting roles? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I got into politics for a, the same reason I got into tech and into Google specifically, which was this desire to kind of make the world better and, and do something. And I know that's why everybody here um, is doing their job as well. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience. And um, I was trying to figure out how to do that. And I thought, do I try and go be an academic? or? And I ended up doing an internship um, with Nick Clegg, who later became the Deputy Prime Minister. And that was my first real insight into what you could do in politics. And it gave me this sort of love and desire for the democratic policy making process, which is not you know, a sexy term. Quite wonky. Um, yeah. It's quite wonky. Um, but I, this is what I write about in the book, is I just have so much respect for the people that you know, sit in the meeting rooms doing the hard graft of, you know, making things better. And so, I, you know, we, we got into government and, and that was fantastic. But um, I ended up working on some tech issues and it was really clear to me that there was this big, what I call democratic deficit in terms of how well the people governing us understood technology. Um, and certainly their knowledge levels compared to the people in the technology Industries novel levels yeah. was huge, and this is sort of 2010. Early yes, 2010s, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so we're just at the stage of you know the mobile um, smartphone revolution taking. Exactly. You know, we just you know people were just starting to understand that, and uh, they they weren't really understanding it, and um, I thought that was a problem. And then I saw um, that Google was just doing this great work, you know, campaigning on stuff. That's always been the great thing about Google, I think, because they've been willing to sort of take positions and say what they think will make. The internet better, you know, and at the time there was a lot of talk about internet freedom and free speech online and that kind of thing. So that's what um, encouraged me to come over and join Google in 2013, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just before, um, just yeah, after a few years in government. Yeah, and then um, you were then obviously getting very deep into tech. Uh, and regulation and society issues. Yes. And then um, DeepMind became part of Google around the same time. Yes, yeah, a year later. Yeah, and that's how I, and I met Demis um, when, Deep, when Google acquired DeepMind in 2014. And I was blown away by the work that the, that the team at DeepMind were doing, you know, seeing the Atari demo, yeah. which I'm sure everybody has seen. And it was really clear to me that the things I cared about, which was primarily, you know, sort of civil rights and civil liberties and tech, that sort of aspect of it, that that was going to be made immeasurably worse or better by AI. Yeah. And I wanted to help be one of the people that made it better. And so um, I said to Demis, uh, I think that you should hire me and I should come across to DeepMind and help you guys figure this out. And he and said yes. And the rest of the city said yes, thank goodness, and started there. Uh, <laughs> it's funny because I, at Google, you remember, Matt, because we were doing this together, it was a very um, testing time for Google and yep. politics. Yep. Uh, we were in the middle of some difficult conversations, and the work that I was doing was particularly around national security and um, radicalization online and those kinds of subjects, which obviously very heavy, but were also very 
uh, under the spotlight at the time. And we were on the front cover of the paper all the time, and it was, it was very difficult. And so it's really funny to think now that I thought, well, no, one, no one's talking about AI. You know, and it's going to be big, but no one's talking about it. And so I'll have a quiet life if I go there. I can just get my head down and yeah. really think what should the strategy be for yeah. AI and politics and policy. But um, Demis offered me the job when he was in the car on the way to the airport to fly to South Korea to do a little, little thing called AlphaGo, oh. um, which uh, set some ripples off. And yeah, if you think the AI hype is big now, you know, it was huge. So I you know, went straight into the fire of all of these politicians suddenly yeah. saying, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, it was really fun. And the, the great thing about um, Demis was that he was always really clear that you know, ethical AI, responsible AI was going to be the, the heart of it. And so um, I set up DeepMind Ethics and Society, mm -hmm. um, co-founded that and the partnership on AI as well. Uh, we were very involved in processes with the G7 and the OECD, so there was no there was no um, hesitancy to get straight involved in that stuff, which was really meaningful. And um, DeepMind had its sort of AI principles, and then I yes. think um, worked together with Google to make them the Google AI principles, which we published, I think, around 2015, 2016, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. I remember talking a lot about those externally at the time. Yes. And, and they they really stood their test of time. They have, and and you know, uh, you know imitation is the best form of flattery. You know, a lot of other companies after that came out with their own principles, their own ethics teams or ethics and society yeah. teams. Um, you know, they were looking at what we were doing. And I do think that what we did at DeepMind in the time helped contribute amongst, you know, a big ecosystem of a lot of civil society and academic mm -hmm. folks as well, but helped contribute to setting that tone and saying, you know, what I was really keen to have people understand is that AI is not Skynet and Terminator let's think about what it actually means and what, what, what we actually have to think about. And I think we really contributed to level setting that. Yeah, and so you subsequently have moved into the academic field. Yes. Um, so why did you do that? Well, I still always had in my mind that I wanted to go back and do that careful thinking about what we could, what we could learn. Because everyone in here will know that the tech industry, we're not always the best at being very humble about the fact that we're not the first to you do what? things. I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, we think everything we are approaching is a problem we're the first, the first time we're the first to be people yeah. to do with it, exactly. And it, which comes from a good place, you know, I think it comes from a place of excitement and innovation, but we're not the first people to do things. And I had that history training, that politics background. I knew that things had, uh, AI might be new, but invention is not new and progress is not new. So how has society handled transformative change in the past? And I really wanted to look at um, a few specific issues. How did we deal with the advent of space um, mm. capabilities? And I really wanted to look at the Warnock Commission, which perhaps we'll talk about in a minute, which was how did society react to IVF and human embryology research, which was new. I feel that I've been very lucky to have this very up close, privileged look at AI in and politics in the past sort of decade or, or more, and I felt that the best way I could have an impact now, I thought I could have an impact in politics, I can have an impact in tech. The best way I could have an impact now was to really share what I mm. what I knew and share what I was finding out, uh, share my experience with a broader sort of wider group of people. Given that AI is so important. Yeah. So that's why I wrote the book. So you felt like you, you needed to make the space so you could do the deep thinking. And then you called it AI Needs You, How We Can Change AI's Future and Save Our Own. And, and you say it's a book for every person with a stake in the future. It's too important to be left to the experts. So what's the sort of pitch for the, for the book? What, what are you trying to distill in it? Yeah, I think what I mean by that is I'm very keen, obviously, based on my, my career, that the people building the technology and who understand the technology are at the table mm -hmm. in discussing what it would look like. But it can't only be us. <laughs> um, because there are life experiences that we don't have. And a lot of the people that are on the sharp end of AI at the moment are people that are not in the tech industry. Yeah. They're in other jobs and they are dealing with automated processes or um, you know, there are other aspects of AI that are affecting people outside of this world. And I really, really want those people to feel empowered to have an opinion and have a say. I think the tech world and AI particularly can be very gatekeepy sometimes that kind of if you look, if you don't understand the technology, then don't try and have an opinion about this because mm -hmm. you just don't get it. 
but my real love of the, going back to why I love this sort of democratic policy making process is because that's actually not what we say as a democracy. We say everybody's opinion is equally as, yeah. as important. And I really think that if we're going to keep pushing down the AI for good, mm -hmm. AI to be its best self, then we need to hear from absolutely everybody. And I want to give people the confidence to say, well, look, I don't understand the technology, but I know that I don't like the idea of AI here, and I do like the idea of it here. And is that OK? And it's like, of course, you know, we need to know that. And I think people building it want to know that, too. I think when I was at DeepMind and at Google, we always wanted to know what people mm -hmm. thought about the technology we were building. So I think it's good for everybody if more people get involved. Yeah, so I had a chance to read uh, almost all of the book. And I guess uh, one of the things that really I liked was that you had thought hard about where are useful historical examples that we could learn from. And you'd sort of chosen, you didn't go back to like the printing press, which, you know, there are all analogies with printing presses and fire and so on. You went to sort of post-World War II, so post the Manhattan Project and the atom bomb, you've chosen the, the space race, uh, IVF and the Warnock, uh, commission around um, in vitro fertilization and uh, and the internet as mm. three examples. So why did you choose them? What were you looking for in those historical analogies? And then maybe we'll unpack yeah. uh, one or two. Well, you're right. I mean, I, when I talk to some people, they're like, why didn't you choose electricity or the wheel or the, you know, <laughs> trains? And it's true, I mean, all of those things. But you know, what, what I'm trying to do with this book is offer something helpful, helpful to people building it, helpful to people interested in. So I wanted to keep it in a recognizable space for us, a recognizable space to, to, to today. And obviously, there are a lot of things that are very different from the 1960s to now. Also, because the atomic bomb really does mark um, you know, a, a fissure in what, what science is known to be capable of and how people in society think about science. Um, it was a real turning point. And more people are aware of this now. The Oppenheimer film is so popular. Yeah. But uh, at the time, there wasn't many of us that had read that whole big book <laughs> and um, were thinking about what that had really meant for, for science. And I think it's really unhelpful that a lot of people in AI talk about AI and the atomic bomb in the same space. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not a helpful or appropriate analogy for so many reasons. So I wanted to find helpful analogies that could actually offer us some lessons. So that's so just, why I focused in that space. Just to get into that for a second before we move on to examples. So why, why, why was that such a moment in science? And why is AI different? Well, it was a big moment in science because there was huge um, government funding for science mm -hmm. on that level, that scale for the first mm -hmm. time, which then carried across into things like the Apollo project because the state was set up for that way. And that's because you know, things change a lot at a time of, of yeah. war. Um, and the reason I think it's not helpful, oh, sorry, there's lots of other sort of geeky reasons around bringing universities more into the military space and so on, but th th some of that is in the book. I'll let you read about it. Um, but it was also very, you know, I think physicists and people in science were very shaken mm. by realizing what, the, what they had built. Mm -hmm. um, and I think AI, you know, it's just, um, it's, AI is not a, a weapon, you know, it's not, um, it's not a weapon of mass destruction. It's not, it's not a thing here designed to, to hurt, and nor should it be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think p making people think that it is does two things that are problematic. One is it distracts us all from the very real problems that we know that we have to right. think about when it comes to AI. Um, and two, because it scares people. And I'm really proud that this is a book that isn't here to scare people yeah. to sell books. You know, I'm not out there trying to freak people out. Uh, because it, you know, makes them want to read what I what I write more. I'm I'm don't want people to be scared because if they are, they'll disengage and they won't yeah. get involved in the conversation. So then you you try to select these examples of things which we can learn. So maybe take us to to one of those and and tell us a bit about what you saw in the in the example that was relevant and how you'd like to see that today's world. Yeah, well, there's so much that's relevant. I mean, that's the great thing about looking back at history. You think God, people really have been through a lot of this before. There's so many lessons in the book from the importance of political leadership, the importance of prioritizing and knowing your purpose and what you're building and, and why. I think my favorite chapter is the chapter about IVF because yeah. it's not something people think about yeah. very often. I thought it was an amazing example to select and then when you explain it, you understand exactly why. So maybe explain that to us. And it was also particularly with having this conversation here in the UK, it was a, a UK specific example. Yes. So, so That's partly why I love it, because it shows the UK in a very the good light. <laughs> moment. I can still remember as a child 
hearing this story about Louise Brown, who was yes. born in a test tube. I don't remember. remember yeah, at the time they could, they said, could test tube babies, yeah. and it was this huge deal. You know, ni 1978, Louise Brown is born, and it was uh, initially in the UK because it was our scientists and sort of British science that had done it. There was a great outpouring of joy, and indeed her name was Louise Joy Brown. Um, but very quickly, it became very controversial. People were worried, what does this mean? Especially when combined with early advances in genetic editing. Yeah, and actually uh, even, engineering. The, even the positioning of test tube baby is not that dissimilar from sort of artificial intelligence. Exactly. It's a sort of terrifying newspaper exactly. headline, isn't it? And if you think, if you look at um, IVF now is just a, in the UK, is a non-controversial, yeah. very happy and joyous science that has brought you know, great advances in um, to people's lives. It's not controversial. Um, human embryology research more broadly, which is what the chapter looks at, not just IVF, but human embryology research, is regulated um, by the Human mm. uh, Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, which was set up in 1990. So the conversation is completely out of politics, unlike the US, where as it went on, uh, who did not regulate, who did not set up any federal um, processes, who did not have something like the Warnock Commission, which we had, which is a diverse, interdisciplinary, independent commission that looked at you know, the issues that were raised by this new technology that could suddenly, maybe it would change what it meant to be human, maybe you know, all the same conversations we're having about AI. And we depoliticized it. They didn't do that in the US. And in the US, you know, as late as George W. Bush, banning stem cell research, which then Obama unbans. So you're seeing this very clear partisan divide in, in this issue. And you know have a situation in Alabama very recently where they look like they're making IVF impossible, you know, difficult if not impossible. And I think that's because it, um, you know, they didn't take the time to put the really thoughtful regulations in at the beginning, which is what we, it took a long time. It took 10 years, yeah, but so we did do it. Take us to that 10 year period. So you mentioned the, the, the headline news, which, which those were around at the time. <laughs> Just looking, I might be the only one. <laughs> uh, uh, can remember as being a like sort of amazing scientific breakthrough, but then yes. lots of concern. Then how did how did that then move away from sort of politics and um, it's Dame Mary Warnock, isn't it, who yes. was appointed? Yes. Not as an expert in the area. No, she that, was a philosopher. How did, it, how did it move from that sort of concern to this process? Well, the what the government did at the time, which was the Thatcher government, um, who were not always great on science issues. But they, they, in this case, they said, look, this is completely unknown. And you have to, it's so hard to take yourself to that space now when IVF is just a completely normal part of life. But people thought, are you going to be able to, you know, create, it, it was just, it was just so controversial on so many levels. Um, and you can imagine what the papers were like. And they said, well, we, we don't know. You know, we don't, this is new. We don't know the answer. Very similar to AI. They said, it also raises a lot of philosophical questions. Um, and they looked at a number of different people to head up a commission. There's, there's a process that we have in UK politics, called a royal commission, it doesn't have to be a royal commission, but it's kind of a, a separate process that happens, sanctioned by government, paid for by government, but it's independent and arm's length, and it reports back completely independently on what it thinks. So they set one of those up, and they, yeah, they had a list of choices, including their head of Bernardo's, the children's charity, heads of universities, who will lead this? In the end, they chose Dame Mary, uh, Baroness Mary Warnock, who had led a similar process before on an educational issue. She was a, herself a philosopher, so she came with no scientific knowledge, no deep understanding of um, you know, biotech herself. Uh, actually, her and Margaret Thatcher did not like each other in any way, but you know, it's a, a great sign in politics to say, look, you know, you're, you're not aligned with me, please give me your independent thought. And um, she, she reported back, and they did this really, uh, have I got time to talk about the 14-day yeah, rule? Please do, yeah. There's there's really um, interesting, innovative thing that they do, which I think we can learn from an AI. So they say, look, there's no answer to this. There's no answer to what should, there's, there's no right and wrong, essentially. Um, uh, what we have to do is just set up a regulatory regime that makes people feel comfortable feel that their concerns are being taken seriously, that someone's thinking about this carefully, and within that, science will be able to flourish. And so they introduced a thing called the 14-day rule, because what became most controversial really was research happening on embryos. Um, people were, were very disturbed and concerned about what that meant. And the scientists were trying to say, 
this, this isn't a person, this isn't a baby, this is a tiny clump of cells, but it was difficult to get that across. So what they did is they introduced a thing called the 14 day rule, which is that research can happen on human embryos up to 14 days, but no later. And what I write about in the book is people admitting later, there's no real reason for 14 days. They, yeah, it could they be sort of 17, could, it could have been be 17. Yeah. There was no reason. They, they said, look, this is when we see the emergence of the primitive streak. And there was a kind of argument, but they say later, there was no real reason. But Mary Warnock said, people need to feel secure and they need to feel that they've seen that their concerns are addressed and we're going to address them by introducing this limit. And it was a real genius move because it, it just took the sting out of the whole thing. People felt, okay, they've listened to our concerns. It was not the scientists saying, you're not right to have concerns. You know, you're wrong. This isn't, this is cells. This is not a child. You have to, in a democratic society, listen to how people feel. So they listened, they introduced this rule. Actually, the scientists were very, very against it when Warnock's report came out. It was the Royal Society didn't like it. There was all sorts of pushback. Nature magazine wrote because an editorial. Because it wasn't really grounded in science. It wasn't really yeah. grounded. They wrote a very, you know, slightly sexist article about Mary Warnock in it, calling her hysterical and all these kinds of things. But what they neglected to realize was that that was doing them a favor. And in the absence of that report getting approved, which it didn't right away, a politician called Enoch Powell, who people may or may not have heard of, but was a very divisive, controversial, uh, in my opinion, not very nice at all MP, um, uh, who was notorious. He aligned himself with the anti-abortion movement and um, tried to ban all research on human embryos, all research. So scientists panicked, realized that the 14-day rule was quite good, and tell the story in the book, but the government um, also came around. But it was very close. The majority of MPs were, were ready to ban it. Um, so the Warnock report came out in, I think, 84, 85, and it wasn't until 1990 that the legislation actually passed. Mm. Um, so it's just this fascinating story of politics and science and the public and morality and philosophy, all of which are so relevant for yeah. us today. Uh, and I just think it shows how, you know, cool heads. It also shows that there's some regulation that might not make total exact technical scientific sense, but that we should still. But having a guardrail that's. We that's should embrace guardrails. Clear. I think as the tech, you know, as technologists, I think we should embrace limited guardrails because I think that does allow innovation to flourish. And we now have one of the best life sciences industries in yeah. the UK and the gold standard for regulation. I have to say, I hadn't appreciated that, but, but really what started there led to the growth of a multi-billion dollar a year industry in the UK, which is still sort of world leading in that in that respect. Yes, and I think you know people might say, well, that, you know, the US is doing pretty well too. Well, yeah. they are, but look at all the political uncertainty. Look at what's yeah. just happened in, in Alabama. Look at the mm. huge controversy still. And abortion is a very separate issue, and there are very different reasons and cultures in the US that make it so. But I do believe that part of the reason that it's still so fraught is because they never set the time uh, aside to have a proper mm. process that allowed people to feel that the government was on top of things. People want to feel the government are on top of things if they're scared. And yeah. it's the same with AI. They're thinking, this yeah. is a bit frightening. People are saying frightening things about it. They want to see that the government is saying, okay, we're going to look yeah. at this. And you, uh, you used the phrase, and I think it was used by others about, um, about the regulation uh, that emerged here of a uh, strict but permissive strict but regime. Permissive, tell, yes. tell us a bit more about what that means, because that, that sounds kind of appealing in a, in a way. You've got clarity, but you've got the room to innovate still. That's exactly what it means. It, it's it's um, strict in the sense that there is a clear line, a clear boundary. You can't do these things. Um, but then after that, it's permissive and innovation is allowed to flourish. And you could see something similar happening with AI. You know, yeah. I think you can't use facial recognition in these areas, yeah. you know, because we've determined as a society yeah. people are too worried about them, yeah. for example. The other example you chose was the, the space race. Mm. And let's just sort of go, go to, to that for a minute, because, um, you know, geopolitically, we're in a different position now, but it's still a rather fragmented sort of position. And the space race and the moon landings and everything else emerged at a, a, a time of real difficulty. Mm. And yet we have this incredible 1967 space treaty, yes. I think, which you talk yep. about. So tell, yep. tell us about that. Yes, when human beings landed on the moon for the first time in 1969, they did so under an existing international legal regulatory regime for space travel. Can you believe it? Um, but space had already been determined by the UN that it was the province of all mankind. Really important. 
it didn't, it is not that you owned the moon if you got there first. But that's, again, something we just take for granted now, but was yeah. by no means a given, especially not during well, the Cold exploring War. Exploring the world, well, the Brits were very good at owning bits of land they stood, we used stood to on. We yeah. stick a flag straight on it, exactly. Right. So, you know. So how did that change? Well, they, they did still stick a flag on it, but it did not belong to yeah. the Americans when they, when they did so. Um, and, you know, that famous phrase, we came in peace for all mankind, mm. So inspirational, and it's de de it was a determined thing by diplomats and politicians. But that was, that was said when the, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis was still recent history. The Cold War was raging. Yes, I, mean, I love this. It's not an obvious. It's not. It was not obvious. I love this chapter too. I'm such a 1960s history nerd, and everything's in it. You've got, you know, I've got the Beatles in there, Martin Luther King, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev, Kennedy. Yeah. Um, but it, really, that all of that stuff was going on, and. They, both Kennedy and Khrushchev, were very shaken by the Cuban Missile Crisis and how close the world came to nuclear war. And it did help, I think, you know, we can't possibly say, sadly, since he died so soon afterwards, we can't say what was in Kennedy's mind. But you know, I've got interviews with some of his um, advisors in there that, you know, he was moving towards this idea of a joint moon mission, mm. not a competition mm. between the Soviet Union and the US, but a joint moon mission. And that obviously did not happen, but out of that desire for actually cooperation, global peace, collaboration, came this idea that at the very least space was the province of all mankind and um, the moon was not to be owned by whoever arrived there and nuclear weapons are not orbiting above us as mm. we speak because of the decisions mm. made back then. Real political leadership, a real prioritization prioritization of the things that are important for the whole globe and not just for one country, mm. which I think is really important to keep in mind as we think about AI now. And you allude to this in the book, um, but but the, the context there was the political leaders had um, come of age or had experience of leadership war. during the war. Yeah. And that, that obviously made some kind of a difference to I really think so. how they operated. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at Eisenhower, who had been a you know, very senior general in World War II and had seen some horrific things. He was at the liberation of one of the concentration camps. Uh, JFK had fought. He lost his brother mm. in the war. And I think that gives you a very different um, view of how quickly, how quick you are to send others into war or to go back there yourself. Yeah. Um, so you, you see them, actually, particularly Eisenhower, um, when Sputnik went into orbit, which big provocation by the Soviets and very scary for the public, he, he could have re retaliated. And instead, he congratulated them for their scientific achievement and got on with making sure the US was scientifically capable too. I, you know, I fear certain political leaders today might not be so calm headed. And I think the reason he was so calm was because of his previous experience. Mm. And, and from that, he set up NASA and ARPA, now DARPA. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, there's, a, there's a quote here that re really resonates about the drawing of these experiences into the moment we're in now, which is that modern man has brought the whole world to an awe inspiring threshold of the future. But we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers and sisters. And that was a quote from Martin Luther King. 60 years ago. Yeah. And it seems very applicable to yeah. the world we're living in today. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I closed the book with that quote from Martin Luther King, who accepted his Nobel Peace Prize and took a big time out in his, I think it was in his lecture, his Nobel lecture, to talk about science. Mm. You know, again, talking about, uh, we've dealt with this before. I mean, Martin Luther King was talking about the importance of yeah. science for humanity, science for people. Um, and I think, you know, he's clearly one of the great... Mm moral philosophers of our time, we have a lot to learn still from him. Yeah. You're basically saying this is, this is too important to be left to the experts. And, uh, you know, I'm not a technical expert. I don't fully understand all the incredible stuff that the, the teams at, at Building Gemini or whatever are doing or the, the team behind AlphaFold. Some of them are probably in the, in the room and in the audience. So how, what level of understanding do you need to be able to contribute to this debate? And how do you help people feel they've got a right to have a voice when they don't understand the deep technical stuff, or even really, you know, how any of it operates. Yeah, and I think there's levels to it, yeah. right? you know, and, and I think you know, I want those experts around the table. I want those experts involved. I'm so pleased that, you know, I'm proud of the team that I built at DeepMind and proud of what Google and, and DeepMind do in terms of engaging with those debates. I, um, but there are levels at which the debate will happen. 
And what I want people to be encouraged by and empowered by is that you don't need to understand deeply and technically exactly how AlphaFold or Gemini works to have a feeling that you, e.g., are really excited and want to see more AI in science because you think it will help make progress. I mean, maybe you have a loved one that mm -hmm. has, a, has an illness that is intractable and they can't make progress, and you think, I want AI in that more. Um, and, and, and I want it in art less, <laughs> you know. Well, that's, um, that's great. You, that's all you need to know. And you can do plenty with that. Um, you can write to your MP and say, I want to see more AI in science. What is this country doing? Or I want to see less AI in schools. What is, what is your policy? Mm -hmm. you, know, you can force your democratically elected representatives to take a view to educate themselves. But you can also put your hand up in this, you know, not talking about in tech companies, but in non-tech businesses that are starting to use AI. You know, people can put their hand up to say, I, I want to be part of the, the, the AI task force that's thinking about this. You know, I, I want to get involved at my kid's school where they're using AI to um, decide whether they're cheating on an exam that they take at home. And I don't like that. I don't think it works that way. You know, there's just so many ways, actually, that you can get involved. So I think you can have any level of expertise and there's somewhere for you to get involved in the AI discussion. And ultimately, the thing I really know um, about politics is the politicians are guided by what, you know, to, to, to a large extent, but what their, their voters think. That's what they're there to do. And they, of course, lead and take decisions. But, you know, when you're in politics, you're thinking about what everyone else or the voters are thinking all the time. And um, so kind of making your voice heard, I think, is really, really important, no matter what level of knowledge you have about AI. So Verity, we're pretty much up against uh, time. Uh, I can highly recommend the book. Having read most of it, I'm going to finish the final section uh, this evening. And um, Matt, call to arms, really, to say we need everybody to be involved in shaping this. We have to do this uh, together as a really powerful one. So good luck with the book launch. Thank you. And thank you for coming back to, uh, to talk to all of thank us. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to be back. Thank you to Verity Harding. Thank you.